Hello, very good morning to you. Welcome to Sky News Breakfast. Now, just 39 days into her premiership, the Prime Minister is fighting for her own survival after a bruising few days and another embarrassing U-turn. The week ended with her reversing one of her flagship economic policies and sacking her Chancellor and close ally, Kwasi Kwarteng. Liz Truss announced yesterday that she would not be scrapping the rise in corporation tax, rowing back on a key pledge in her leadership campaign. She also confirmed Jeremy Hunt, who supported Rishi Sunak's bid for Prime Minister, as her new Chancellor. But her actions reassured neither the financial markets nor her own MPs of her economic credibility. A party source has told Sky News that a substantial number of Tory MPs have now submitted no-confidence letters in her leadership. And the pound and government bonds continued their slide. So more on the financial fallout in just a moment. But first, Liz Bates reports on a day of political turmoil. The papers are the latest to line up against Liz Truss. And even her biggest backer has had enough. After showing her Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng the door yesterday... Should Liz Truss resign, Mr Kwarteng? Should Ms. It was Truss her future in the spotlight. And in an effort to calm the markets and her colleagues, she U-turned on yet another flagship economic policy. We need to act now to reassure the markets of our fiscal discipline. I have therefore decided to keep the increase in corporation tax that was planned by the previous government. This will raise £18 billion per year. It will act as a down payment on our full medium-term fiscal plan, which will be accompanied by a forecast from the independent OBR. Cutting ties with the mini-budget and the man who delivered it. I was incredibly sorry to lose him. He is a great friend and he shares my vision to set this country on the path to growth. Sacrificing one of her closest allies to save herself. A show of strength or a sign that she really has lost her way. You and the Chancellor, the ex-Chancellor, designed this budget together in lockstep, we're told. At times in secret, the two of you. He has to go because of the fallout from it. How come you get to stay? Well, my priority is making sure we deliver the economic stability that our country needs. That's why I had to take the difficult decisions I've taken. Prime Minister, um, you're out of your depth, so aren't you, Prime Minister? You're out of your depth. There were more questions, but no more answers. After just eight minutes, it was all over. She may not have said much, but the turmoil at the top of government speaks for itself. An awkward start for the man who will take over at number 10. Jeremy Hunt, no stranger to the top table, he has plenty of political allies. But will they join him alongside an increasingly isolated Prime Minister? In Westminster, her enemies are everywhere, in the streets and behind closed doors, with senior figures in her party privately in talks about not if they should remove her, but when and how. And in public, even her supporters are unhappy. Like most colleagues, I think um, it was with uh, disbelief uh, and uh, certainly with despair that I listened to what she had to say. Dark days in Downing Street and there are more to come. Liz Truss has only just started, but this is already starting to feel like the end. Liz Bates, Sky News, Westminster. So all eyes now on the new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. There he is arriving at our Westminster offices in the last few minutes. I'll be interviewing him in the next few minutes here on Sky News, so do stay with us for that. Well, the Prime Minister's latest U-turn has prevented an estimated £19 billion worth of extra government debt, but that doesn't come close to closing the black hole in the public finances created by the government's mini-budget and energy support package. Our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, takes us through the numbers. Liz Truss was forced to act by a crisis of economic confidence in her and her now ex-Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng's plans for the public finances. This is how the Office for Budget Responsibility said things looked before the mini-budget. It shows national debt as a share of GDP. You can see it's forecast to fall over the next five years. That told markets that in due course, the UK would pay its own way. But this is what the mini-budget did to that 
calculation. It slapped £45 billion of unfunded tax cuts, plus the energy bailout and other costs on top. And the Institute for Fiscal Studies calculates that has left a £62 billion hole that needs to be filled. A huge gap for new Chancellor Jeremy Hunt to have to close to the satisfaction of the markets, the OBR, not to mention Conservative MPs. Now, the U-turn on corporation tax has closed the gap by £19 billion. And the 45p rate cut worth £2 billion, that's already been ditched. But that still leaves a gap of £41 billion. Now, the national insurance cut, which is staying, accounts for £18 billion of that. And other cuts, including to the basic rate of income tax and duty-free, add another £6 billion. But even if all those tax cuts were reversed, it doesn't fill the hole. And Liz Truss has signalled that public spending cuts are coming. As yet, the markets are unconvinced. This is what's happened to 30-year bond yields. That's a measure of the cost of government borrowing. In this case, the rule of thumb is if the line goes up, it's bad and down is good. And you can see that pressure was rising early in the week. It was higher at one point than after the mini-budget. But it fell on speculation of a U-turn and again on news Kwasi Kwarteng was flying home from Washington. But before and after Liz Truss's speech, Yields rose. That is bad news for government and all of those worrying about their mortgages. Now, since the mini-budget, the Bank of England has been trying to prop up that market and prevent a run on pension funds by buying gilts. The bank spent £19 billion in total of a possible £65 billion it had set aside, creating a deadline that helped, perhaps, dictate political events. Fingers will now be crossed at the bank and the Treasury that these steps have been enough to restore financial stability, whatever the cost of the Prime Minister's political credibility. Well, the recent market turmoil will impact millions of homeowners. New analysis suggests more than 5 million families will see their annual mortgage payments rise over the next two years. According to the Resolution Foundation, millions of households are predicted to see their annual mortgage payments rise by an average of £5,100 in the next two years. Of that total increase, the Foundation attri attributes £1,200 to the effect the mini-budget had on interest rates. And by the end of 2024, it's estimated that 5.1 million mortgaged households, or nearly a fifth of households across Britain, will be spending more on their housing costs than they do now. Well, let's take a look at the papers now. And there's really just one story dominating the front pages. The FT says the PM's economic strategy has been shredded and that MPs are in a state of mutiny. The Times, meanwhile, says that the appointment of a previous Sunak supporter in Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor signals Liz Truss's political weakness. Truss clings to power, says the Daily Telegraph. The paper reports that scores of MPs are plotting to replace her. Similarly, in the eye, Tory MPs tell Truss it's over. The Mirror's headline, Time's up. They report on growing calls for a general election. Well, the Express maintains its loyalty to the Prime Minister. Vultures are circling, the paper says, but trust is not for quitting. But the unusually supportive, rather the usually supportive Daily Mail is running out of patience, asking how much more can she and the rest of us take, is the question they're asking there. The Guardian, meanwhile, describes yesterday as a day of chaos and humiliating for the Prime Minister. And The Sun, perhaps the exception this morning, is leading instead on the death of the Harry Potter star, Robbie Coltrane, which is... its headline is A Giant of Our Screens. So, as you can see there, all the front pages focusing on the events of yesterday, which included the appointment of a new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. I'll be speaking to him imminently. He's uh, just preparing as we speak. And so, uh, here's Jeremy Hunt a little bit earlier on. Um, obviously, a lot of... Uh, 
eyes on the new Chancellor and what kind of direction he will take uh, the economy in uh, as he takes over from Kwasi Kwarteng, who lost his job yesterday. Uh, he was sacked and found out as he came back early from a trip to the IMF in Washington. Um, also, Liz Truss decided to reverse another key element of the mini-budget yesterday, a reversal on the corporation tax measure. And she hopes that those two steps will allow her to draw a line under some of the problems that have been perceived uh, over the mini-budget and uh, with a new Chancellor will allow her to move ahead. Uh, so we can talk to him. When Kwasi Kwarteng was sacked yesterday, uh, Jeremy Hunt, a former Rishi Sunak supporter, was not the replacement that many expected Liz Truss to appoint. But speaking yesterday, the Prime Minister insisted that Hunt, who she called one of the most experienced and widely respected government ministers, was the right man to tackle one of the toughest intrays of any new Chancellor has faced in decades. So I am joined now from Westminster by the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. Very good morning to you. Thanks so much for talking to us here this morning. Good morning, Anna. Now, the, the government under Liz Truss has lost the confidence of the markets, hasn't it? It's seen people's mortgages costs shoot up. It's been forced into major U-turns on key economic policy and has had to sack the Chancellor after fewer than 40 days in the job. Why do you want to work with this government? Because I want to do the right thing for the British people. It's a big honour to do the job that I've been asked to do by the Prime Minister. But I want to be honest with people. We have some very difficult decisions ahead. Uh, the last few weeks have been very tough, but the context, of course, is coming out of a pandemic and a cost of living crisis. And the thing that people want, the markets want, the country needs now is stability. No chancellor can control the markets. Uh, but what I can do is show that we can pay for our tax and spending plans. And that is going to need some very difficult decisions on both spending and tax. Uh, but that is what I must do now so that people who are worried about their mortgage costs going up, people who are worried about how they're going to get through winter uh, with the cost of living crisis, people in the NHS who are worried about the pressures they're facing, can be reassured that the fundamental stability that they, they need from the government, they expect the government to provide, is there. You say you want to restore stability, but the, the party and the country, actually, its reputation for economic competence has been trashed by the mini-budget, hasn't it? I mean, Kwasi Kwarteng has paid the price for that by losing his job. But can you rebuild that reputation when the architect of those proposals in the mini-budget is still in her job? Liz Truss is still Prime Minister. Well, she's been Prime Minister for less than five weeks. Um, what I would say about the mini-budget is... look at the, the chaos that it's caused. Well, let's talk about the mini-budget. Um, the most important element of it was the energy price guarantee. People's energy bills were heading for £6,500. This will keep the average one down at £2,500. That's very important to families up and down the country. That's staying. But there were mistakes. It was a mistake when we're going to be asking for difficult decisions across the board on tax and spending to cut the rate of tax paid by the very wealthiest. It was a mistake to fly blind and to, uh, to do these forecasts without giving people the confidence of the Office for Budget Responsibility saying that the sums add up. And the Prime Minister's recognised that. That's why I'm here. Uh, and what we need now is for me to show Parliament and the markets that we can make our tax and spending plans add up. That's what I'm going to do. And I want to say this, Anna, if I may, we will have some very difficult decisions ahead. Uh, spending will uh, not rise by as much as people would like. And all government departments are going to have to find more efficiencies than they were planning to. And some taxes will not be cut as quickly as people want. Some taxes will go up. So it's going to be difficult. But as we take those difficult decisions, my priority, our values as a government, will be to protect families, businesses who are going through a very challenging time. We'll be thinking about the most vulnerable people. This is a compassionate, conservative government. And the other thing is that we still maintain total fundamental confidence in the potential of the British economy. We have enormous amount we can do. We're the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. 
But we've m remained a strong economy because at difficult moments like this, we've been prepared to take tough decisions. And that's, I'm afraid, what we're going to have to do. OK, and I'm going to explore those tough decisions and what it means for spending in a moment. But first of all, I want to get a sense of the direction that you're heading in because uh, the mini-budget has had its heart ripped out of it, hasn't it, after these reversals on corporation tax and the 45p tax rate. Many are saying that trustonomics is dead. So what is next from you in terms of policy? How much of a departure will there be from Liz Truss and Kwati Kwating's vision? Well, um... As I said, some of the things were mistakes, but the fundamental strategy behind it all, which is that we have to solve the growth paradox. If we want well-funded public services like the NHS and to keep taxes low and falling, then we have to increase our growth rate. That is absolutely right. And I also would like to be able to cut corporation tax. I want us to have the most competitive business taxes because that's the way that we'll help to grow the economy. Um, but the way we did it didn't give people confidence. That's what we have to change. And that's my job in the next couple of weeks with the, the statement that will be coming out on the 31st of October. Can the markets wait that long? They're clearly not satisfied at the moment. They think that the sums don't add up. They, no doubt, will want to see more details. And what will they be? Will that mean more reversals on the mini-budget? Will there be more U-turns? Well, I'm... Being very straightforward, we're going to have to take some very tough decisions on both spending and tax. As I say, spending will not go up as much as people want and there'll be more efficiencies to find. Uh, and we won't have uh, the speed of tax cuts we're hoping for and some taxes will have to go up. That's the reality of the very challenging situation we face. But remember, Anna, we've only heard one part of the equation. We're hearing now about some of the difficult decisions but also there's enormous potential for growth with some of the other policies that we'll be announcing in the next few months. And when you see the package as a whole, what you will see is a vote of confidence in the British economy. This country that has four of the world's top ten universities, that has one of the world's two biggest financial centres, Europe's biggest technology sector, we have a huge amount going for us. But we have to do that by taking difficult decisions at moments like this, and that's what I'll be doing. More efficiencies to find. Are we talking austerity level cuts again? I don't think we're talking about austerity in the way we had it in 2010 when I was also in the cabinet. But we are talking about very difficult decisions in budgets where there is already a great deal of pressure. Um, so, so which budgets, which departments are likely to be targeted? Well, I'm going to ask all departments to find more efficiencies than they were planning to find. Um, remember, I ran the biggest spending department uh, for many years, so I know how just how difficult it is to find those efficiencies, but we're all going to have to play our part across the board. Um, but I do want to reassure people, my priority as we take these decisions, and indeed the government's priority, will be to help families and businesses that are struggling and to demonstrate that as a country, when we go through difficult times, we understand the pressures facing the most vulnerable people. Are there any departments that you can guarantee will maintain their funding? Will the NHS still get all the funding that was promised when the health and social care levy was announced, for example? Well, the government's already made that commitment um, and we fully, I think I understand more than most, the pressures in the NHS and indeed the social care system. But I'm not going to make any specific commitments about specific departments now. Uh, or indeed on the tax side about specific taxes, because we have to look at these things in the round and we have to make sure as we take these very difficult decisions, we're honest with people about the situation we face, uh, the, the big international challenges, um, we're going to take those difficult decisions, but we are going to remember that as a country, we are a decent country, we are a kind country, and we will remember the needs of the most vulnerable people as we take those decisions. Will Liz Truss, as Prime Minister, ever be able to inspire the confidence of the markets when her central ideology has been such a disaster? Well, I think her central ideology has been that we've got to get growth into the economy. I think she's the first to accept, in fact, it's the reason I'm sitting here, uh, that the way uh, that she and the former Chancellor went about it didn't work, and that's why we're doing it a different way. But the objective to get growth into the economy so that we can fund the public services like the NHS that we all need so much. That is absolutely central to me and every single one of my Conservative colleagues. 
And that we are going to go about with redoubled effort because it's so important. It's, it's important in the good times, but it's very important in tough times like the times we face right now. It's interesting you talk about uh, your uh, Conservative colleagues. I mean, there's still turmoil in the markets, even after her announcements yesterday. Sterling and the bond markets uh, suffered. If the markets don't bring her down, isn't there a high chance that Tory MPs will? Well, what the country wants now is stability. Um, you know, as you mentioned in your introduction, I didn't vote for Liz Truss, um, but I'm supporting her because I agree with her fundamental plans for this country, which is to get us back growing so we can afford all the things that we really want uh, to be successful, um, but also to be a compassionate society, to have really good public services. Um, and I think that's what the country wants. They want a Conservative Party that is united behind our leader um, and is trying to do the very best thing for the country. And I think actions speak louder than words. That's what we're going to do heads down over the next few weeks and months. OK, Jeremy Hunt, uh, the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, on your first full day in the new job, thanks very much indeed for your time. Thank you. So, plenty to pick over there with our political correspondent, Rob Powell, who's been listening in there in our Westminster studio too. Uh, so, Rob, what do we learn from the new Chancellor of the direction of travel uh, with him in the job? I think that was something of a cold, hard reality check from the new Chancellor uh, there, Anna. Uh, Jeremy Hunt making quite clear that his primary purpose in the Treasury right now is to restore um, economic credibility to the UK, restore economic stability um, as well. Um, he said that essentially his job now was to show how the government can pay for its tax and spending plans. And he uh, made no bones about the fact that this would be difficult, that there would be some very tough decisions. He said that departments would have to find um, efficiency savings. Essentially, public spending would not rise as expected and that departments would have to cut back their budgets. You pressed him on whether that would mean the NHS got all their money. He said that was already a commitment that was made but didn't make any specific commitments. That raises so many issues around whether the NHS does get the money it was expecting, around whether the Ministry of Defence gets the increased funding that it was promised by Liz Truss during the leadership campaign. And follow on, following on from that, there are the political consequences of how do the various secretaries of state react to the fact that they are being told to trim their budgets now. Also, on the issue of tax as well, we clearly know that corporation tax will now be going up. Jeremy Hunt, I thought, hinted that potentially there could be more measures to come on tax when he said that some taxes won't be cut as quickly um, as some may want. Does that mean further U-turns on things like the cut to the basic rate of income tax coming down to 19 pence in April next year? He also said that some taxes would rise, clearly a reference to corporation tax there as well. But I think that was quite a sobering analysis of the position we are in uh, and quite a sobering um, judgment, if you like, uh, appraisal of the impact of the last few weeks and of the job that Jeremy Hunt now has ahead of him. And, and of course, uh, our viewers will be watching closely, but so too will Tory MPs and the markets. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I think, obviously, it's too, too, probably too early to say with certainty, but I think there will be a degree of reassurance that is given by um, that interview because what was emphasised more than anything, it was clearly the message that Jeremy Hunt went out there to put out there was about restoring stability and credibility and once again um, saying that the UK should be a country that essentially shows how it is going to pay for its spending and for its tax cuts. He admitted that there were mistakes that had been made over the last few weeks. He said that it was a mistake to fly blind in the mini budget. That's a reference to not having the OBR forecast there, not having that independent scrutiny um, of the plans that unsettled the markets uh, and went on to unsettle so many MPs. He said it was a mistake to go for the 45 pence um, cut as well. So admitting really that key planks of the trust agenda for the last few weeks, key planks of the government that he has just joined, were not in the right place over the last few weeks, and essentially saying his job in the Treasury now is to try and put out some of those fires that had been started by his Cabinet colleagues and by his predecessor a few weeks ago, and try and restore some semblance of credibility and stability to the UK um, economy. So, 
um, sobering, I think is the word I'd use, uh, about that interview, but also probably humbling, uh, given that he is essentially, Jeremy Hunt has essentially said his job now is to repair some of the damage done in the last month. Yeah, he kept talking about stability, didn't he? I'm sure that's um, something that he will continue to talk about um, over the next few days. Uh, fascinating to see what the reaction will be. But, Rob, thanks very much indeed for that very quick take on our interview with the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt. Plenty more on that throughout the morning, of course. In the meantime, though, also making the news this morning, at least uh, 25 people have died in an explosion inside a coal mine in northern Turkey. Officials say the explosion was likely caused by naturally occurring flammable gases. Emergency teams have worked through the night to rescue the dozens who were trapped following the blast. A new video has emerged online showing an Iranian police officer sexually assaulting a female protester while trying to arrest her. The video, filmed in the capital Tehran, has sparked outrage on social media, including from pro-government figures who've condemned the perpetrators. Female voices can be heard in the video shouting, why is no one coming to her rescue and why are you hitting her? Schools across England and Wales are providing unhealthier and poorer quality food due to the rising cost of ingredients. The School Food Association, LACA, found that as many as 1.8 million children have been given less nutritious lunches as their schools grapple with higher prices on the shelves. Sky's Sadia Chowdhury reports. I like English, maths and lunch. I like the times when, when we do maths, science, especially lunch. Every morning... Ask children about the best part of school and many will say lunchtime. In one of London's most deprived boroughs, the school meal is often the most important of the day. We don't get hurting bellies and get enough energy for, for learning. I like lunch because I like to get a hot meal on the table. I like to eat and also so that I don't complain, I have a, a, I have a tummy, I have a stomachache. Fresh fruit and vegetables, quality ingredients and locally sourced products could now disappear from school menus, unravelling decades of progress. If the, the impact then rolls itself and cascades and eventually gets to the kitchen and we then start churning out fast food, low quality meals that are not healthy for the children, it then creates the whole issue around the obesity challenge that we're trying to tackle, the challenge of unhealthy um, meals and unhealthy habits that then lead to later on in life. Caterers say the rising cost of food will force them to abandon national guidance on healthy and nutritious school meals. We currently cook from scratch everything in, in our school meals, but again, we might be having to consider using some processed foods, some sauce mixes and the like moving forward. The government says nearly two million children have access to free school meals and that the Chancellor's new growth plan will raise living standards for everyone. It told Sky News, we are also supporting schools with £53.8 billion in core funding this year and a £4 billion increase in overall funding from 2021 to 2022. I'd love to send them in impact lunches every day, but we just can't afford to. And the whole point of school meals is that children who come from low-income backgrounds have access to good you know, good quality food that they may not be getting at home. At this school, there's a new menu coming after the half-term holidays. It is, they say, a step backwards. Sadia Chowdhury, Sky News, in Newham, in London. Well, tributes have been continued to roll in from Robbie Coltrane's former Harry Potter co-stars, including Daniel Radcliffe, who said, Robbie was one of the funniest people I've met and used to keep us laughing constantly as kids on the set. I feel incredibly lucky that I got to meet and work with him and very sad that he's passed. He was an incredible actor and a lovely man. Emma Watson wrote, Robbie was like the most fun uncle I've ever had, but most of all, he was deeply caring and compassionate towards me as a child and as an adult. There was no better Hagrid. You made it a joy to be Hermione. 
And Tom Felton, who played Draco Malfoy, posted, one of my fondest memories of filming Harry Potter was a night shoot on the first film in the Forbidden Forest. I was 12, and Robbie cared and looked after everyone around him effortlessly and made them laugh effortlessly. He was a big friendly giant on screen, but even more so in real life. Thank you, mate. Love you for everything. Now, a reminder of our top story here today. A short while ago, I spoke to the new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, in what was his very first TV interview. And uh, this, in fact, is him arriving ahead of that uh, in interview in our Westminster studios. Um, and he told me some really interesting things. He said that he was going to have to make some very tough decisions on the economy. He said that some taxes will have to go up in order to reassure the markets that the government can pay for its tax and spending plans. And he also warned on the subject of spending that it won't rise as much as some people would like. He said all government departments are going to have to find more efficiencies than they were planning to. Uh, and he told me that Liz Truss made some mistakes in her previous economic plan. So uh, we'll bring you more of what he said in the next hour and more reaction. Uh, right now, though, let's take you through the morning newspapers, which, of course, uh, went out before uh, word from the Chancellor. Um, and we can chat through uh, some of the stories now with the broadcaster and journalist Afia Hagen and the commis political commentator uh, Benedict Spence. So welcome back uh, to, to both of you. And as we discussed in the last hour, um, all the political manoeuvrings um, make the front pages of, of the newspapers with the uh, sacking of Kwasi Kwarteng and the reversal of the corporation tax measure yesterday. But you're uh, now delving inside, aren't you? Um, and, and Benedict, you've picked out a story in The Telegraph um, about uh, the PM's plans on tax rises. Yes, this uh, this talks uh, in many ways very specifically about corporation tax, and I, I think it is very interesting actually what uh, Jeremy Hunt has said to Sky earlier, which is of course that uh, you know, there are probably going to be tax, yeah, it, well perhaps not tax increases necessarily all over the place, but in some cases there will be you know some things that were going to be reduced, as in the case of the corporation tax, uh, yeah. that reduction isn't now going to go ahead, it's going to stay the same, um, and that there will have to be government efficiencies elsewhere. I, I suppose <laughs> some people might call those austerity measures. Um, and, and that is the thing, really, isn't it? You know, that for all Liz Trust was promising, you know, that we would go for growth and that there would be low taxes, ultimately her entire economic platform, or most, uh, most of her economic platform that was worth its salt, is dead in the water. You know, she's no longer offering us this, this low taxation, high spending, situation and i think that that is why you know there is such you know such a morose mood across all of the front pages today that she simply can't survive because actually it was about her economic policies that she sort of hung her coat on and it's gone now and there's you know, i just don't think that there's any coming back from that it is very interesting uh truss uh, said before she became prime minister that it was things like the rising corporation tax which was uh, you know, proposed by uh, rishi sunak of course her main rival that these things would cripple the economy because they would you know they, they would stave off growth after a very difficult winter um it's also very interesting because of course that's a tax rise that jeremy hunt was also very firmly opposed in fact he wanted to reduce corporation tax even lower uh, than it was before Rishi Sunak put it up. And now you have these two these two individuals saying, oh, well, you know, it, it, things are probably going to have to change. Now it's going to be much more sort of in line with uh, cutting government spending. Uh, and, you know, I think that that really, you know, it's such a, you know, we, we use the expression U-turn, but it is such a screeching one. And yeah, that is why I think, say again, I just don't think she, she is long for this political world. She cannot control, uh, c command the control of her party if she is forced to make such a massive sweeping change to the entire ideological platform that she was elected on. Well, yes, and a lot of the front page reflect that, that point of view, uh, I have to say. But um, we want to cover a few of the other stories as well, because we're discussing an awful lot, uh, the, the, the politics um, throughout the programme. But I know that you've picked out some other um, issues as well. Afia, inside uh, The Express, you've picked out a story about the, the rising COVID cases. Yes, so this is The Express, page 25, I believe. Um, and this story basically tells us that COVID infections have risen by 31%, and that is the biggest jump uh, since June. Uh, and most of Britain is suffering with steadily increasing levels of the virus. Uh, now, most of these have been in older people. We've seen an uptick of infections in older people and an uptick in hospitalizations as well. Um, so it's got 1.7 
million households have tested positive for COVID uh, in the last week. September 23rd, October 3rd, can uh, compare to 1.3 million in the week before that. And as we go into, into the winter months, uh, as people are indoors more, and of course, viruses spread more easily, uh, we've got also flu is around in the winter as well. And so we've kind of got this uh, double barreled effect that we're going to have of more flu cases and more COVID cases. And this is something that we are going to have to learn to live with as we go into these winter months. You know, the COVID uh, infection has not completely died out. Um, it's thought that you have perhaps some newer variants and perhaps some older ones as well at work causing the uptick in these cases. And it is thought that these cases are going to rise as we go to the following weeks. There is a bit of a lag between uh, the actual fact infections and reporting because of the time it takes to gather that data. But we could see even next week and the week after uh, more okay. people having infections as well. Yeah, so it's another thing that we all need to keep an eye on. Um, in the meantime, um, uh, the Daily Express uh, has a story that you've uh, spotted, uh, Benedict, which, again, more kind of ominous noises coming out uh, of Russia. It is. And I mean, you know, the, the war in Ukraine has been pushed off a lot of the front pages by what's going on domestically and the cost of living crisis and such. But I think it is worth revisiting this. Uh, you, we often do here, don't we, talk about you know nuclear weapons. And, and this story is about uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, as the headline says, threatens global catastrophe of Russian and NATO troops clash. But why this is more important, I think, than you know, just the standard Russian saber rattling is it comes in the aftermath of a, a bit of a tit for tat actually b between sort of Western leaders within NATO itself. Emmanuel Macron tweeted a couple of days ago that we don't want World War Three, and this, of course, caused a, a quite a bit of anger amongst a lot of NATO allies, not least Ben Wallace and and the UK. The idea that you know we're, we're potentially you know, giving away our secrets to Russia uh, and, and saying that there are certain things that we won't do and certain lines that we will allow to be crossed. And I think it raised the spectre for a lot of people of what happened in Syria when, when Barack Obama did not respect the red lines that he drew when it came to chemical weapons use. Um, but why this is significant is Josep Borrell, who is a, a senior security uh, minister within the EU, uh, has said that if Russia were to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, uh, the EU would not, uh, NATO rather, would not necessarily respond with a nuclear strike, but that it would lead to the destruction of the Russian army. And you, you know, you have to sort of read between the lines there. You got two very different approaches. You know, Emmanuel Macron, who's trying to play the peacemaker throughout, saying we don't want war, we don't want this, that, and the other, and other people within NATO, within the alliance, saying actually. You know, d don't mess about with us. We're prepared to go very hard here. In this story, it's interesting. Um, Putin also criticizes uh, Olaf Scholz and Germany for siding with NATO. That's what that's what the the copy says. Siding with NATO. Germany is a member of NATO. Germany is a a very important part of NATO. And it is as much as anything Vladimir Putin's actions that are forcing the reluctant members of NATO, like Germany, like France, like Turkey to side more with the more belligerent sides, like okay. Poland and the Baltics. And I think that that is. This is something that we have to be very aware of. Nuclear war is, of course, very dangerous. The West is not threatening it at this moment. But it, you know, Russia is responding to what the West is saying, which is that we won't be pushed about here, even though Ukraine is not a member of NATO itself. OK, yeah, and that's um, another one to keep our eye on. Um, in the meantime, the, the one headline, the one front page, rather, that didn't focus on um, the uh, political machinations affair is The Sun, isn't it? And they um, led on Robbie Coltrane's death that was announced yesterday, sadly. Absolutely. This legendary actor, Robbie Coltrane, who died at the age of 72. And, you know, a lot of people know him for his role as Hagrid in Harry Potter. We're big Harry Potter fans in my house. Uh, so that's what my daughter knows him for. But, you know, Robbie Coltrane was on stage and screen for such a long time. And I remember him in Cracker uh, yeah. as the character Fitz, who he was incredible for, and Tutti Fruity, you know, this yes. Scottish drama about this wayward Scottish band that I watched later on in life because it was on in the 80s when I was younger. And Robbie Coltrane was such a stalwart of stage and screen and did so many different parts, you know, started off in the comedy scene and was this huge, larger-than-life character. Uh, and he once described himself okay. in Cracker uh, saying, I drink too much, I smoke too much, I gamble too much, I am too much. But oh. a, really a legendary character. Yeah, it's so sad. I'm going to re-watch Cracker. I absolutely loved it. Uh, we're out of time. See you both next hour. Thanks so much.
Thank you.